to our session on the role of governance in addressing climate and environmental challenges in the Asia and Pacific region. My name is Kim DeRitter. I'm the Director for Environment and Climate Action with the Asia Foundation. Now, some of you, not all, but some, will ask the question, what does governance have to do with environment and climate issues? If you're asking yourself that question, you've come to the right place, because the answer is basically everything. Governance has basically everything to do with a country's ability to meet and respond to the serious climate and environmental challenges that they face. There's a common misperception, even among development practitioners, that climate and environmental problems, because they involve science and technology, primarily require scientists and technical experts to solve them. While, of course, we need these experts to identify solutions and to help guide us as we identify the best options available, there's a big difference between knowing the best way forward and actually moving in that direction. In my experience, science and technology, that's the easy stuff. Getting people to change their behavior, especially collectively, forging a shared vision and then working towards that common good, creating the momentum by which communities rethink and retool their livelihoods, and countries rethink and retool their economies, away from business as usual and onto sustainable trajectories, now that's where the real challenge is. The Asia and Pacific region is facing all manner of environmental crises. With only 30% of the world's land area, it is already home to 60% of the world's population and is still adding about 40 million new souls every year. That's the population of Nepal, Laos, and Mongolia combined every year. This growing population places an ever-increasing demand upon an ever-shrinking natural resource base. As resource extraction intensifies to meet growing demands for food, water, energy, and other essential inputs for economic growth, the finite underlying ecosystems upon which these environmental services depend become ever weaker. Water, arable land, fish stocks, and necessities upon which rural populations depend are becoming increasingly scarce. And already precarious situation further exacerbated by drought, floods, and ecosystem disruptions by a changing climate. Meanwhile, access to basic natural resources, especially water, is fast becoming a national security concern for most countries, many countries, several countries. Already 40% of all intrastate conflict is linked to natural resources. Tackling environmental problems, changing the way we relate to the environment and to the planet, requires strong governance structures. Structures that enable each country's leaders, policymakers, practitioners, and stakeholders to understand the issues and their root causes. These actors are the same actors who must evaluate the short and long-term trade-offs among response options and engage in constructive dialogue with all the other actors, be they government, the private sector, or civil society. These are the actors who most often must come together to take ownership of a shared problem, to forge a shared vision for progressive reforms as a foundation for building the collective political will to see their way through these, cri these crises and onto more stable, sustainable footing. For those of you who don't know us, the Asia Foundation, we are a governance organization. We work on climate and environmental issues because the principal obstacles to progressive reform are not scientific, science and technology issues. The obstacles are governance issues. We work in pretty much every area of the environmental issue spectrum 
including natural resources management, especially water and forests, but also land use and air quality. We work on disaster risk reduction and climate resilience, including infrastructure and, and nature-based solutions. And we work on green growth, clean energy, and other aspects of climate mitigation. At any given time, we have between 35 and 50 separate projects active in this space across the region funded by the, uh, Australia, uh, the UK, United States, uh, several um, private foundations, but there's always so much more to be done. And because we are a multi-dimensional organization, most if not all of our projects incorporate other program priorities, such as women's empowerment, conflict mitigation, environmental justice, economic development, and regional cooperation, which only serves to increase our relevance as well as our impact. Today, we will share with you four case studies demonstrating a range of governance programming modalities applied to four different environmental issues in four different parts of the region. Let me now take a moment to introduce our speakers and their topics in order of presentation. Our first presenter is Ms. Nandita Barua. She is the country representative for our India office with the Asia Foundation. She will be speaking on the role of governance in advancing climate resilience for India's rural poor. Ms. Barua brings over 25 years of professional experience working on gender, human rights, labor migration, and human trafficking issues in South and Southeast Asia. Among her many accolades, Ms. Barua was awarded the Prime Minister's Gold Medal by the Royal Government of Cambodia for helping to develop and improve victim protection policies and practices in that country. Ms. Barua holds master's degrees in political economy as well as in historical studies from India. Our second presenter, Mr. Nguyen Chi Tan, is environment and climate change specialist for the Asia Foundation in Vietnam. Mr. Nguyen will speak on the role of the private sector in promoting Vietnam's climate and energy agendas. In addition to his 12 years with the Asia Foundation, Mr. Nguyen spent six years with Vietnam's Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment as head of the Environmental Sciences Consulting, as well as head of Environmental Health Division. He holds degrees in agriculture, agricultural engineering, and business administration from Vietnam and Australia. Third, Mr. Raprianto Alam Surya Putra, Director and Envir uh, of Environmental Governance for the Asia Foundation's Indonesia office, will speak on how his program has already prevented the deforestation of 4.4 million hectares of, through governance approaches that he has employed in his country. Mr. Surya Putra has over 20 years of experience working in the development field primarily with the foundation but also the World Bank in areas of environmental and economic governance, social accountability, decentralization policy, and progressive uh, business enabling environments. Mr. Surya Putra holds degrees in anthropology from Indonesia. Our final speaker for this session is Mr. Winston Chow the Asia Foundation's Mekong Safeguards Program Chief of Party, in addition to serving as the Foundation's Special Advisor for Energy Programs. Mr. Chow will speak to us on his work assisting countries of the Mekong region to develop infrastructure that responds to often competing resource use priorities, and particularly the sustainability and resilience priorities of the diverse stakeholders they serve. Among other positions, Mr. Chow has served as country representative for China for the Global Green Growth Institute, and he holds degrees in public administration, business administration, finance, financial accounting, and business analytics uh, from the United States. Each speaker will have between 10 and 12 minutes to present, and we will take all four presentations in succession 
So please let me ask uh, members of the audience to hold all questions until the final presentation is delivered. And at that time, we will open it up for questions. With that, let me turn the floor over to Ms. Nandita Barua to start us off. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kim. And that was a really generous introduction. Um, a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, this is a post-lunch session, so I'm sure it's going to be harder for all of us to be able to speak in a way that we can keep the audience engaged. I will try my best. Uh, I want to begin by saying I have a PowerPoint, which I absolutely hate. Um, I'm terrible uh, with that, but I will use it because I've been told that it may make it more interesting. Do ignore it, just listen to me. <laughs> so, um, I am Nandita Barua, as Kim introduced. I am from India and I'm heading the foundation's uh, office in India, the country office in India. We work on a variety of issues and climate and environment is one of those issues which we have been looking at for the last, I think, six years. Um, before I really go into talking about the case study, I want to give a little background as to how we arrived to do what we what I'm going to share about. Um, you know, about four years, six years ago, we started with a program which was funded by Australian DFAT called the SDIP, Sustainable Development Initiative Program for South Asia. It was a regional program. And among three other components, one of the areas that that project was looking at was on water governance. And the idea was that India is a country with huge amount of water contentious issues, not just internally, but externally with our bordering neighbors, whether it's Nepal with Kosi, with Pakistan, with Bangladesh on the Padda, and the Brahmaputra, and the Yangtze, as it is called, from China down to India. Um, and within India, the multiple rivers that flow, and the states who seem to believe that they are the custodians of an entity which they obviously cannot control, and also the belief that this is a finite resource. And I think we were tasked with our understanding that we need to make water governance uh, more inclusive, more equitable, uh, make people who are at the helm of managing water issues understand and prioritize what needs to be done at various levels. Um, I think it was a great idea, and we, we thought we started off well. And as we started working at both the levels, right at the top level where there is a water tribunal in India, and at the community level, where the issues related to water, the riparian communities, the farmers, are most experienced, the disconnect was evident. Uh, interestingly, I think, the question we asked ourselves is, why did you call it a tribunal? Because the tribunal automatically makes anything related to water to be discussed as contentious. So first learning was there really was no concept of how do you collaborate around water. It was either your mind there, and then somebody had to take a decision. The second thing that we realized was that what was happening at the central national level was totally disconnected from what the community was experiencing in relation to their access to water, their livelihoods, their lives, equity, disaster, and the mitigating efforts that were being carried out to facilitate uh, things to improve. There was a complete disconnect. And that's what got us then thinking, well, maybe we need to relook at what we are doing and think about addressing this more from, from the bottom up. Because I, I, we do agree that the top level, the central and the national level were important. But if those conversations were not guided but what, by what was happening in the community, the solutions were half-baked or the solutions did not affect or impact the people that ought to be impacted. So what would we need to do then to improve policy and decision making? I think a couple of things came up. One, of course, a comprehensive policy and legislative framework, and I can tell you, those who know India, there is no dearth of legislative frameworks in our country, multiple.
pollution. So why is it so why is the pollution level peaking at this point? For example, it's again this whole issue about resilient farming. We have an entire farm belt surrounding Delhi where this is the season when crops are harvested and to clean up the stubble, they just burn it. Um, why do they burn it and not use any other resource? Because it's more expensive to use any other resource. Is there no other technology? Absolutely, phenomenal technology by the IITs of India, but again, cost. You know, for a small farmer, it makes it more sensible to just light up a fire, burn the stubble, and then get on with it with the next cultivation. So building capacities becomes something that I think is invested with the government. I know that civil society organizations have been trying to do things, but the scale and size of the country makes it impossible. So while we looked at a comprehensive policy and legislation as one level, and we talked about you know, issues of financing, adaptive capacity, it needed to be unpacked. How, did we, how do you go about doing all of that? All the lofty things that I just talked about in the beginning, building capacity, is that you, we needed to get down to the lowest level of governance in India, and that's the village. So every village actually is entitled to do a village planning process. It's called the village planning process to create uh, equitable villages, to create healthy villages, to create resilient villages. And I think unpack this and no, don't give it to a consultant because he'll try and give you something which can be done, but maybe that's not what the villagers want. Um, so started working with the village communities, with the locally elected leaders, with the women's group, with the self-help group, uh, farmers collective at the lowest level to come out with what it would mean and picked up uh, ideas. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, traditional knowledge of agriculture is actually very, very resilient. They have an entire understanding of nature-based solution. They have been using that, but right now, why bother with nature-based when you can buy pesticide? You know, um, also because there are companies and agencies who are pushing pesticides. For example, crops. You know, why bother to recycle when you can buy hybrid crops? Um, not knowing that the the susceptibility of some of those croppings are much higher to climate. So, eco-sustainable solutions is what we started working and started saying, okay, how do we get farmers to build their capacity to really unpack resilient village, which went back to actually pulling back some of the traditional methods of doing agriculture, but pitching it up with a higher level of technology that's available today, and also looking at uh, solutions that are scalable, you know. So flood resi resilient participatory planning, we actually sat down with women's group to do that, you know. How, how do you do that? Where, what is the, when do the water start coming in? At what point do you think you need to move your plant, uh, farms further down? It was also linked with the kind of policies that have been applied. Earlier embankments on riverbeds used to be mud embankments. Uh, for some reason, some years ago, I don't know when, uh, states across India decided that cement embankments were better and so a lot of money started going into making embankments which were cemented. And the community knew that was not a great solution because they said, well, these embankments are in any case going to break because the flooding of the rivers around those, that belt of the Kosi, of the, you know, of the Ganges is so high that any embankment will not survive when it's in high tide and flood, and especially now with incessant rain and flooding. And having the cemented embankment meant that the levees went way deeper they were cut because there was no absorption of the water at the start level. And so, again, solutions were there. They said, well, you know, in the past, we would actually put a lot of these kind of trees and plants or these kind of, you know, embankments, mud embankments with a mixture of certain uh, plantation. So getting them back to saying what, can it, what would work for your village and your community um, and what techniques would work? You know, how do you revive the technique of farmers farming on the silted area? Promotion of biopesticide. Interestingly, India invented neem pesticide, which is globally more popular today than in India. And neem is one of those plants which has actually got a very high um, antibacterial pesticide value, um, goes a long way. So working with the farmers, and because I don't have time, I can explain some of this in Q&A, 
was to build their capacity at this various level and put that in the plan so that the resources that were being pushed by the village local government to, into building cemented embankment could actually be used for more efficient management of the floodplains, for example, or management of creating the resources for the villagers to be able to actually apply resilient um, agriculture. And things came up. They said it would greatly help if we have a grain bank. It would greatly have help if some of those resources put into a seed bank. How about a shared agricultural uh, equipment center? Because they are medium, small, and very small farmers, and not everybody has a resource to bring in an electric um, you know, sewing machine or an electric tractor or any of those even small equipments that are needed for a farmer to make his or her life easy. And we really looked at women farmers as well because in India, a, a large front line of the workforce in the agricultural sector is also women. So putting those as a part of the government's planning to say, this is what would help. Secondly, identifying the most vulnerable stakeholders who can then be linked to government schemes. Again, at least if not 10, 20 schemes exist for farmers in India. Um, but the ability to say who can access what paperwork is needed, that's again the missing link. So building that so that the government and the vulnerable people could take advantage was, of what was available to them and the government could deliver on good governance by doing that. The second thing was also to look at border issues because you know our rivers on, on the northern side of India are transboundary. We, we have a long boundary with, border with Nepal. We also on the eastern side have a border with Bangladesh. But on the Indo-Nepal border, I think the floodings have been really bad. And Kosi, which is one of the biggest river, is most affected. And two things happen. When flood happens, uh, lives are lost. Agricultural farmland is lost. But conflicts arise as to whose liability is it to pay the people. Did India re release the water when it couldn't contain it? Did Nepal you know, do something where the dams were not well prepared to store water? So there is a lot of finger pointing that happens in contestation, which trickles down to the communities. And communities, riparian communities who live by the riverside face the same problems, face the same issues, tend to then get into contention with one another, which is unhealthy. So the other thing we also looked at was saying, everything that's happening on the Indian side needs to be translated in a conversation to the Nepal side. So transboundary citizen forum were created to help at least the exchange of ideas and thinking um, you know, to the other side of the, of the uh, river border, um, and therefore getting the engagement of local representative even on the Nepal side of the border was something that became a part of the citizens forum's responsibility. Um, and again, looking to create, and looking at all of this, I think we worked with our partners to say, okay, having identified this, worked with these groups, created these platforms for exchange, what would be two or three key policies moving forward that we need to present? So agricultural yield, food, food security, in, incomes of small farm holders. Each of these issues were unpacked to say, where is finance going to be required? Where is it going to be necessary to look at more food banks? Storage of food grains is, terrible in India. I mean, this has been a demand for years now. Um, and the, uh, the amount of grain that basically is wasted to bad storage um, is actually very, very large. And I think uh, it's unfortunate that it's still happening. So looking at the lowest level and not expecting the center to and the state or the central government to come and do this, but getting the village government who is empowered, the district government who is empowered to start putting their resources as a part of their planning process, which feeds into the national plan was what we worked at. So supporting the government to respond to community. Um, it's also a little tedious and long drawn process. So I think when funders and donors expect results to happen in one year, one year, I'm sorry, it can't. And as a result, we have used our own resources for this because this entire process takes at least two, two and a half years uh, to even get it going and it will probably show result in the fifth year. Um, and that, that was the first part of a of our work at the community level. The other thing was, and this was really people, this was people, women, marginalized groups that we were trying to address. The other thing we also realized is that the water discourse has two debates, one at the community and what happens to people who are affected, but it's also, you know, I cannot change the entire bureaucracy and technocracy and the hydrocracy of the government of India, or for any state for that matter. But I think what was important to see is, is there ways we can influence the thinking that is happening? within these circles. 
so that they recognize the need to understand the local and the contextual reality in the policy discourses, discourses in the tribunals that they sit in. Um, and there again, I think, we looked at basically injecting this whole conversation into academic courses which are being taught on international relations. I don't know how many of you are aware of the Indian administrative system is, but we have we inherited an administrative system from the British Raj where we have an Indian administrative service where students from some of the top universities apply for and get in and then they become the administrators and bureaucrats who move up the ladder. So we decided to do, actually I'm going to skip this, we decided to do more policy directed work with academic institutions. It took us two years, but we ended up being able to start off with a course on hydro diplomacy and water governance, which is a multidisciplinary course in three universities in India. We picked up two on the eastern side because of the border issues, IIT Gohati, um, Sikkim University, and one on the southern side, which is more for southern interstate conflict-related issues, University of Pondicherry. And the idea here was, again, to get these universities to start providing these courses to upcoming students at the master's and the undergrad level, most of whom who may be applying for some of these administrative positions, but also available to others who may want to do it as a summer course. Um, currently, I think we are very encouraged by the response. Uh, again, a slow process because introducing any course which is not defined by the government into an university, which is a national university, requires you to go through multiple channels, the Academic Council, the University Grants Commission, the Education Ministry. Uh, however, it's doable. And we've done it in three universities now. There is a big demand from others. And this course currently is being taught as a full credit, four credit course as a part of any department or discipline that the university chooses, chooses to. It's, import, it's, uh, it's, it's important to note that the course is being taught and designed, and we worked in the curriculum in such a way that it has a component of technology, it has a component of gender and equity, it has a component of international relations and public policy. And that's why we called it a course on hydro diplomacy. And it's a multidisciplinary approach to really water governance, aiming to create a newer thinking, a newer discourse on how water governance is to be handled. Um, Two of the universities are actually looking at moving it beyond just a, a regular credit course in a master's program. Pondit Sikkim University has pushed it to a research and PhD scholars program, and Pondicherry University, with whom we have recently signed an MOU, we are actually now looking to create a complete um, department, a separate school, which will teach hydro diplomacy. I know it will take another three years for us to reach there, but it's a start. And I think the, the fact that there was an appetite for this there was a buy-in, and the number of students who enrolled for this program from across um, schools was, was very interesting to note. We had engineers enrolling for the course in IIT. We had um, political economists uh, enrolling for it in Pondicherry. We had international relations students enrolling. It was not easy to teach because it's a new course. We had to curate a list of academicians, experts, teachers from across India and make them available to the university so that they could deliver it because the universities by themselves didn't have all the faculty. Um, so that little help went a long way. Um, and I guess, I think for us, this is one of our programs with the least amount of financial resources that we put in, but the maximum amount of leverage and um, success, I would say. So I think looking at some of these areas, we feel that when we work on climate and environment, for us, it's beyond just trying to you know, look at the larger macro picture of nations about what they're doing on climate, but really building the story from the community to the highest level and vice versa, so that you know, we don't miss out on the links that are critical to addressing the needs of uh, climate and environmental sustainability. And our farmers and our women at the community understand what sustainability means and how to apply it. So thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Kim, for your uh, general introduction about myself. Um, 
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Chi Tang. Uh, I'm program specialist in environment and climate change at the Isa Foundation office in Vietnam. Uh, the presentation I'm making today is on my own perspective uh, related to uh, private sector engagement in environment and climate actions. Uh, it's done us include all the work that the office uh, doing with the private sector. It also doesn't mean that the office uh, has done nothing with uh, non-government sectors. We do have a lot of program working with uh, local NGOs and CSOs. Uh, but I hope that my presentation will be meaningful for all of you here to understand what we are doing with business and how we do uh, the thing with them. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, this slide show you uh, an overview of our program uh, accomplishment over the years uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, that includes capacity building for disaster risk management for small and medium enterprises, uh, and develop a low carbon uh, industrial modern internal cities, uh, climate change res uh, resilient assessment toolkit in Long An province. We also uh, done a couple of uh, political economy analysis on energy sector and climate change, and also um, the assessment of uh, impact assessment of EU carbon border assessment mechanism on Vietnamese economies, and also um, policy papers on energy development, which we call Made in Vietnam Energy Plan. Uh, we also are working on business resilient network development. Uh, with the uh, Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industries. We also uh, pilot the public-private partnership at subnational uh, level for flood, uh, flooding mitigation. So, uh, at any other stakeholder, private sector, you know, um, has a very important role in uh, environment and climate action uh, governance. Uh, Number one, they influence the quality of the environment. They are the polluters sometimes, but uh, we see them very often that as the green performer. Uh, by green performer, we mean that they are changing their business models to uh, be more aware of the environment, especially of the climate change. Second, they are the core implementer of climate action we in particular see them uh, focusing on clean, trans clean energy transformation to meet with uh, greenhouse gas goals. First, they are the source of funding and initiatives to support local organization um, uh, you know, in terms of the environment and climate change action through their corporate social responsibility or environment and social safeguard program. Uh, final but very important that they can lead the environmental and climate change policy reforms. Uh, for example, uh, Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, VCCI for source, recently beginning to integrate green growth issue into their uh, provincial competitiveness index system, that kind of uh, economic governance tools. And another example is that the uh, working group under Vietnam Business Forum, uh, which is the power and energy working group, is working very closely and regularly with government counterparts to, uh, uh, for the energy development policy and regulation. Um, I would like uh, to, uh, this slide and the following slide, uh, you know, uh, I would like to say that in our experience, if we understand the incentives of the private sector in envir environment and climate action, we can encourage them to act in different ways. Um, in our study with VCCI in 2019 about the impact of climate change on business community in Vietnam, realized that 
at least 70% of business in Vietnam has had some impact by climate change. And three prime, as you can see from this chart, three primary impacts, which is the business and production interruption, uh, labor producti productivity uh, reduction, and revenue decline. And this is a great opportunity for us to work with private sector because they understand very clearly the impact of climate change on their business operation. Uh, they just also um, uh, show you that, you know, not only private sector get impacts by climate change, they also, uh, you know, both domestic invest, uh, direct investment uh, and foreign direct invest investment firms see the opportunity in climate change. Uh, the opportunities uh, uh, is the, uh, are the restructuring, reorganizing production process, uh, creating new products and services, uh, new markets for existing products, or branding opportunities. This is also the great opportunity for our office to work with private sector to uh, make the transition to lower carbon economy. So why the private sector is the most effective partner for environment and climate action? Um, within the political, uh, Vietnam political uh, space, where the um, uh, decision-making authorities seek for inputs, feedbacks, or opinions uh, during the policy uh, development, pro uh, development process, we see that private sector has more uh, effective and advantages than other non-stakeholder, non-state stakeholders. Uh, you know, uh, in in uh, in you know um, policy development process. That's why uh, um, this is because that they have uh, you know an. Uh, official institutionalized uh, voices in business association, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, and also Vietnam business forums. And they also take part in very dynamic uh, uh, communicate, flow of communication with, uh, you know, within their community and so with government stakeholder. Um, so, uh, with this, uh, the ISA Foundation office in Vietnam, you know, uh, supporting the improved uh, governance through the uh, promoting and facilitating the dialogue uh, between, you know, private sector representative and uh, uh, international and local organization and government uh, stakeholder. As you can see from this uh, picture, uh, this is the panel discussion about the EU uh, carbon uh, border uh, adjustment mechanism impact on Vietnam economy that is done by our office. Uh, this is to gather the uh, opinion from different stakeholders, including private sector, uh, government uh, agencies, and also from local NGOs. So, um, you know, uh, with, with the promoting and facilitating the dialogue between private sector uh, and other stakeholders, we try to influence government to improve their policy um, uh, and regulation in a way that enable business to, uh, uh, you know, to do better in terms of the environment performance and invest more on green growth areas. So what is our approach with private sector? First, we need to be part of the game. Uh, the ISA Foundation maintain active working relationship with some key business groups, that including Vietnam Business Forums, uh, AmCham Board Governors, AeroCham Green Growth uh, Sector Committee, and Vietnam Chamber of commerce and industry, the largest business association in Vietnam. Second, we need to follow the streams. By follow the stream, I mean we are trying to align the business and government interest to address the climate change to engage with business association. That includes identification of business needs and interest, 
leading and coordinating policy feedback communication, engaging with government authorities, and integrating low carbon transition into a policy reform tools, and finally, testing the innovative public-private partnership model at subnational level. So what do we do? First, uh, we need to, uh, we identify the gaps and priorities and also mapping the key stakeholder through uh, political economy analysis and also regulatory assessment. Because if you uh, want to do the policy reform, we need to know what matters, who are the key actor and influencer in the field. And second, uh, we do uh, policy reform through multi-stakeholder dialogues or promoting the business government uh, dialogues or develop policy paper, develop a policy paper such as Made in Vietnam Energy Plan. Third, uh, we do capacity building uh, on disaster risk management for small and medium enterprises. And last, we support business network developments. For example, we, we work with VCCI in Mekong regions to set up a uh, Mekong Business Resilient Network where business can network together doing research, inform government, and promoting the opportunity for their resilient products and services. Uh, that's all, and thank you very much for, for your attention. Okay, now switch to Indonesia. Yeah, uh, thanks Kim for uh, opportunity for me to share our program uh, that implementing in Indonesia on applying governance approach in environmental sector. That's called Setapa program. Uh, as you may aware or know about the Indonesia, Indonesia is the second largest uh, rainforest uh, cover in in the world after Brazil, and and uh, over uh, ten years, Indonesia has challenges on the threat of deforestation and degradation in Indonesia. So our Stapa programs in which uh, aim to reduce deforestation and degradation in Indonesia through improving forest and land governance with support for the UK government, uh, FCDO, that uh, started in 2011, I think. Uh, this project uh, through three project cycle period. So uh, I would like to share the some experience, some achievement, and highlight what we already did under the Setapak program. Uh, through partnership with over 70 implementing partner organization, that mostly the civil society organization, our program advocacy and technical assistance effort has successfully to prevent it over 4 million hectare forest and land from threat of deforestation and degradation in Indonesia. The prevention of deforestation and land degradation was contributed by some CSO activities, particularly on strengthening C uh, law enforcement agenda. By bringing the CSO with skill in investigating and reporting violation cases at the field, program enhanced civil society capacity in monitoring and reporting the forest violation. Uh, for, for instance, that after the decentralization era, the many head of district, many head of the region, has issued number of land-based industry permit that is around um, over uh, 5,000 mining permit already issued by the all government level in Indonesia. So by developing 
collaboration with key government agencies, CSO partner have initiated over 1,000 non non-compliant mining permit uh, that have uh, mining mining permit which have been revoked by the national government. So this effort. Uh, has uh, collaborated with the anti-corruption uh, uh, anti-corruption commission that the that called KPK in Indonesia. The second, the engagement with and facilitation with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry has resulted the obtaining of a 140 social forestry permit, which cover over 300,000 hectare of forest concession to local and indigenous community, including women group. The obtaining permit for communities are resulting the improvement of forest quality condition and enhancing livelihood at, and well-being. Another impact through reforming fiscal policy and the formation of ecological fiscal transfer policy, CSO partner also contribute to make the, the government budget available to finance some environmental protection agenda. It was allocated over 9 million US dollar uh, during last uh, two years. Uh, the other achievement, the program also supported the government to design and implement the policy more better which mandating sustainable forest and land management practices, including the implementation of ecological fiscal transfer to incentivize uh, forest conservation in Indonesia. This is the, the new promising scheme or policies that already adapted by the national and subnational government. It's, it is around 18 subnational government has adapted the ecological fiscal transfer scheme, while international development partner in Indonesia, including UNDP, USAID, and also ADB, for instance, has incorporated in their own project development. This program also using an evidence-based approach, measuring forest and land governance in subnational level that help to promote public participation and accountability. Furthermore, the program also improve environmental outcome in subnational program area. For instance, in Riau, that uh, this program has resulted the reducing number of forest fire hotspot and promoting on using renewable energy in North Kalimantan provinces. What we already uh, applying the approach, the governance is the essential ingredient to help Indonesia on addressing this forest and environmental challenges. Civil society effort to address deforestation were often weak, uncoordinated, and limited involvement in policymaking processes. So building and empower CSO capacity and network is really, really important. Transfer knowledge among CSO who expert on governance aspect, for instance, anti-corruption uh, works uh, and also budget advocacy works, uh, and CSO who expert on technical issue and environment, for instance, that uh, more focus on conservation, for instance, and rehabilitation uh, for land area uh, that create solid and strong CSO coalition and several issues and areas. This, is, uh, this slide is also the example on how TAF support its CSO partners to work politically, that is, to navigate the political landscape and identify potential allies or opponents that have policy influence, mobilize constituents, and form coalition for reform in order to achieve governance uh, reform. A working politically approach has enabled the issuing policy reform to answer good 
forest and land governance at the local and national level. Building coalition reform with engaging ministries and local government, including oversight body uh, like anti-corruption commission and ombudsman, universities and research institution, as well as parliamentary member are significantly accelerating the reform agenda. Identifying the government champion and promoting them on Green Leadership Forum also contributed uh, to speed up the adoption. The strong coalition need also build the trust its, its uh, parties, particularly between the CSO and law enforcement agency and officers that possible to share the data and responsibility to taking the next action. CSO and law enforcement agency have a grid monitoring instrument that, that and use the CSO data to take the government legal action. On the other hand, with built the coalition for reform also develop a strategy to maximize the policy adoption more sustainable. Integrating reform policy into government development and planning policies provided long-term adoption to be more sustainable. Last uh, but not least, this program learned some lesson. The first that the program of approach of investing in the capacity of civil society organization has shown to be highly successful, producing ripple effect across multiple sectors that related to land and forest government uh, in Indonesia. By providing training and ongoing support to enhance CSO ability to work politically, the program has grown to size reach and impact civil society effort to improve forest and land governance in Indonesia. Second, maintaining a balance between demand and supply side approaches to optimally fill that space by bringing a passion for synergy and complementary. And uh, finally, connecting land forest sector into governance aspect improve uh, forest outcome in Indonesia. I think uh, it, uh, this presentation might be uh, useful for all of you. Thank you. Get set up here for a moment. I think we're good. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kim, for the introductions and nice work, colleagues. Um, bear with me a little bit today. I'm a little bit under the weather. It's not COVID. I checked. So I think we're, you know, we're running for the exit, but it's open. <clears throat> so, so I'm Winston. Nice to meet you. I'm originally from New York City, and this is my first time in Australia. So uh, I'm really curious about everybody that we have in the audience today. Just by show of hands, can I ask, uh, how many folks here are Australians? OK, that's a good, that's a good number. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you work or study infrastructure? Any? OK, we got one. All right, great. Two. All right, good. I guess my question I'm most interested in is, how many of you um, here, as a, as a private citizen, um, have had your say? on say a large piece of infrastructure, a rail, a power plant, or a highway or something that is, that's come through your neighborhood? One, two, not, not too many, but not bad. Is it, is, it, uh, is it because you kind of, for those that, that haven't really had that say, it's because you really kind of trust the powers that be, the leaders, that they're not corrupt or anything, that they're, 
they're good decision makers when it comes to the hundreds of millions of dollars that they're spending on that piece of infrastructure that's going to come through your neighborhood? Is it, is it because you trust them that much? Uh, just curious. Okay. <clears throat> so, <laughs> good morning. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Whoa. Took some cough medicine there. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining today. So building on some of the concepts and examples my colleagues have touched on, I'm going to delve into some of my experiences as the chief of party of the USAID and Australia Mekong Safeguards Program, which I'll, I'll call Mekong Safeguards for short. A lot of what we do is related to governance directly, but the difference remains that we work on governance in an area that is distinctly technical. In a sense, we attempt to utilize governance tools as a means of scaling data-driven science, engineering, and technology perched on that which affects the lives and environments of many of our stakeholders uh, on the backs of immense infrastructure projects. So before I descend too far into lofty metaphors, let me bring this back into describing exactly what the program I lead at the Asia Foundation does. Mekong Safeguard uses governance, technical assistance, and capacity building to deliver knowledge and practices that drive and incentivize the Mekong sub-region countries to transition to sustainable infrastructure through the adoption of strengthened environmental and social standards and practices. Now, because there are no global stand there's no global standard for that yet, for these kinds of safeguard standards and practices, they come in many forms. We determine, we determine, we determine the standards and practices we aim to adopt with stakeholders from a demand-based center. Uh, that is, we, we determine what the stakeholder, in most cases the governments that we work with, companies and communities, what they're trying to achieve, and, the work, uh, and, and then work with them to choose the standards uh, to reach those aims. Uh, we specifically focus on hard infrastructure in the power and transport spaces, so power plants, solar farms, hydropower, rail lines, waterways, uh, roads, those types of things. A very unique aspect of our program, though, uh, Australians might be interested, is that it's one of the few, if not the only, to my knowledge, flagship programs that are jointly funded between Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT, and the United States Agency for International Development, or we call USAID. As such, governance takes on a double meaning for this project, because we need to focus both on how governance tools serve our stakeholders, as well as governance as it applies to consolidating the protocols and practices of implementation relating to both those government agencies. The gist of it is that DFAT and USAID systems are surprisingly compatible uh, with a few contradiction, cr contradictions which we've had to smooth over. Um, the biggest difference in is, is in communication protocols in this region. Um, I mean, if you look at this color scheme, if you take any issue with that, that's what happens when the US and the Australian government come to some sort of compromise. So if you don't like these colors, that's the sausage we make. All right. So uh, the biggest difference, of course, is in, is in communications protocols. Not of course. It's an interesting thing between the US and Australian governments. The, the Australian government tends to be uh, a little more delicate, uh, especially in this region, because it's sort of your backyard. So uh, the US kind of treats it as uh, something more distant, and perhaps they take a few more liberties when it comes to what they communicate. Uh, in this region. Uh, by this region, of course, I mean the Mekong sub-region. <coughs> we serve Thailand, Lao PDR, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So our program has been around since 2018, and it's entering, entering its fifth year. As such, we've produced a suite of resources that, for lack of time, I won't advertise in detail here. Suffice to say, they are pu they're published works, resources, and governance tools available to you as development professionals, practitioners, and planners. Happy to talk to you afterwards if you'd like to get access to those. For today's panel, I'd rather focus on two specific projects we work on that highlight governance activities we engage in and at different levels. Now, by different levels, I'll talk about our work with the Blue Dot Network, which is a US, Australia, Japan-led multilateral platform for infrastructure quality. I'll go into our support for Thailand's energy ministry to reach their net zero targets, which will have resoundingly transboundary impacts with Laos and our private sector work uh, there as well. As I'd mentioned, the governance tools we use are no secret for those that are familiar with them. Technical assistance and capacity building on data-driven policy making and rules development. These include imp uh, uh, importation of technical standards and codes when related to the energy sector. Again, we take a market-driven approach, so kinds of governance standards we use depend on what the, stakeholders, uh, what the stakeholder we're working with is aiming to achieve. 
For instance, many companies aim to receive financing from the International Finance Corporation, so in those cases, those are the technical standards we aim to adopt. Other times, we get more progressive, uh, we get more pro progressive stakeholders looking at the adoption of, say, gender equality and social inclusion where current legal standards don't exist, but where government and companies wish to reach greater heights in sustainability. Where I personally believe we've utilized the Asia Foundation's technical competitive advantage is in combining pragmatic methods with specialized resources that TAF, the Asia Foundation, possesses as an implementing partner. Whereas most large implementing partners last a lasting, lack a lasting presence, they usually complete the work they're contracted to do and then depart the country or region. Uh, TAF has a strange little secret. We, it's not really a secret, but not too many people know about it. Is we also get U.S. congressional funding. It makes up a small portion of the funding streams that we have. Uh, and that has allowed us to be able to establish long-standing offices and leadership in, con uh, in countries, many of which goes back decades. This, is not only, uh, this not only creates existing relationships, but helps uh, projects ramp up much faster with fewer startup costs. As to methodologies of governance and approaches, TAF understands how sensitive govern governance is, its relationship to sovereignty and national security, especially in energy and transport sectors. Now, this is why in our energy and climate work, we also focus on entrenching local teams in country and use native expertise who understand the political economy, nuances, and local negotiation coalition building in country, and cultural integration. All of this ties into our demand-based approach, which ensures TAF and stakeholders co-design governance solutions. So one more expansive example of how our localized approach has translated into governance tools is in our recent resistance to the Blue Dot Network. Implemented by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, based in Paris, the network is constructing a global infrastructure quality certification that it hopes, hopes banks, governments, and developers will adopt as an international standard. The challenge is that infrastructure, and especially the issues that come with infrastructure development, mostly appear as localized issues that are highly nuanced. While OECD doesn't really have the resources to gather this in-country first-hand data, our program, Mekong Safeguards, provided a feedback study to OECD on its quality certification that specifically drew upon local, social, and environmental issues we observed working in Mekong subregion countries. So in a sense, we used our governance tools to improve this larger spanning governance tool in improving how we could drive policy and decision making with regards to environmental and social sustainability in infrastructure. Another project we are engaged in at a national and transboundary level is our work supporting Thailand's uh, energy sector. Um, in a USAID context, this project is dear to us because it took probably around four years to formalize. That's, that's a pretty long time for a uh, USAID project. In fact, it spanned across multiple USAID projects to, to actually get formalized with the Thai government. As I mentioned, governance assistance is commonly taken as a weighty subject regarding infrastructure, and for a long time, the Thai government remained unresponsive to U.S. technical assistance to work on its national energy planning. However, the new carbon neutral and net zero GHG emissions targets set at COP26 provided a window of opportunity where there was a realization within the governance uh, apparatus in Thailand that this could not be achieved without outside help. Now that I think about it, it's kind of ironic. So that means COP26 in itself was a governance tool that kind of forced Thailand to look outside uh, for technical assistance to reach its GHG targets. So as I'd mentioned, entrenched uh, local expertise, working technically across three organizations in Thailand's ministerial system, that's the Energy Ministry, its Office of Energy Planning and Policy, as well if, as its electricity utility, with sensitive government energy planning data to integrate several foreign resource planning systems, not easy. To recruit and deliver the knowledge and expertise required, TAF had to go beyond, uh, and, uh, beyond that and, and offer uh, sorry, beyond offering best practices and utilize development professionals native to the region uh, with the rare background of working for the government and utilities we're now partnering with. TAF's long-standing presence in Thailand since the 1950s, as well as its organizational agility, this is a rare combination, enabled the team to capitalize on, de uh, on developed trust and begin delivering highly technical analysis while handling sensitive energy planning data with the government. So this allows for very substantial results. Our work will enable the Thai energy authorities to go beyond renewable energy adoption 
and develop higher efficiency and emissions reduction standards for power plants across the country. Now, more specifically, what does this mean for Thailand? That work will offset 15.27 million tons of CO2. That's the equi equivalent of taking 3.3 million combustible engine cars off the road annually. That's 32% of all the cars in Thailand. So a few power plants, a few, co few coal-fired power plants made more efficient makes a really big difference. All right. Uh, while there's a lot of other projects I can talk about, I'll leave just these two examples today and hop happy to follow up with anyone who has any questions afterwards or if any of those resources are interesting to you, happy to speak about that too. Thank you very much. You can do both. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look, although only one of the presentations, Vietnam, focused specifically on the role of the private sector, you know, there's obviously an element of the involvement of the private sector across all of what we've heard. Um, and, you know, my view from a governance perspective is one of the key things that we need to be able to govern effectively is this insidious greenwashing that we mm. see. And I'm really curious about your views across the panel around how governance can play a role in um, stopping the private sector's approach to greenwashing. Sure. Uh, I think we all have... Uh, I, I, what, I, perhaps I could start and then you, you follow? I, I, I think I'm mic'd already. Oh, yeah, you are. I thought it was just your <laughs> beautiful singing voice. Uh, one, one, of the, uh, one of the more innovative, one of the more interesting... ...private sector organization who has already championed um, best practice. Um, it doesn't always happen, uh, and it, sometimes it's hard to find. I remember once working in Indonesia uh, with an oil palm company where half the oil palm com company, well, most of it was focused on the bottom line and uh, the, the amount of money that they were making, but there was still uh, a, a small group of actors within that oil palm, palm country, uh, company that was looking at best practice, how to um, uh, um, reduce the, uh, the uh, deforestation and concentrate on already degra degraded lands. And once, uh, from our point of view, if we can identify uh, a champion within the private sector who can serve as an example and can help lead the uh, other actors within that, that particular industry, uh, that's, um, that's often a, a very good sp uh, starting point. But that's just one of, I think, a few ways in which we might approach it. But let me ask my colleague, uh, Winston, to, to follow up. Okay. Thank you, Kim. That's a really good question because it's a huge problem, uh, probably one of, one of the larger obstacles to transitioning to sustainability everywhere. So the, the, uh, uh, that's something that we do work on and, and, and it's a problem we have to face because the first thing is standards, or actually really standardization. We live in a time right now where uh, standards, uh, it, where, where, where uh, kind of sustainability hasn't been standardized, especially not globally. Nationally, there are some, there are some standards that do uh, carry, and there, there, there are some sort of uh, badges and brands associated with that. LEED is one of them, for instance, in architecture, in buildings, they even upgrade to neighborhoods. So there are ways um, that some companies can hope to kind of green their real estate that way. But when it comes to things like, like large infrastructure, um, uh, and, and these types of things, it's, it's, uh, there, there, there is no real global standard um, that carries right now, and that's why you know, a lot of the times uh, when we work with uh, companies to do things, it's, it's really demand-based, but we do have to make sure that they're stringent, and I think you know, working with uh, the U.S. and Australian governments do, do, does keep us honest in, in, to that extent. You know, they, they look pretty closely at these types of things. But um, I think also, besides standardization, which may take a, a, a quite some time, there's also enforcement. Um, and that's particularly important, especially when it comes to the financial sector. 
Um, and I think, you know, you, you, you probably know about this, if this is your question, but the Security and Exchange Commissions in the United States have been going after compa uh, companies or specifically large funds um, for doing exactly that, greenwashing. Um, and I think it was, uh, I don't want to call it the wrong company by mistake, uh, it's, but uh, uh, anyway, one, 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 one of the large ones, I think they was, was fined about a million dollars uh, this year um, for, for doing exactly that. And there were a few other companies, large um, funds that were, that were uh, involved in that too. And these were, these were investment banks. Um, so so uh, I think it has to come from multiple sides um, before anything can really be done about that. But financing is, is one of these areas that I, that I think is, is crucial. Um, to get it right because it's it's so easy to manipulate. Anyone else would like to speak to that topic? Uh, yeah, I will <coughs> share the story in Indonesia about greenwashing. That this is the good idea that greenwashing issue has been raised by the Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, in in 2018, the KPK, Anti-Corruption Commission in Indonesia, uh, initiated the movement on how to save the national, uh, the natural resources uh, sector uh, uh, on the corruption issue, and including greenwashing, uh, uh, particularly on greenwashing uh, issues, uh, KPK, uh, have already gathered the all private sector who has uh, operated on land-based industry in Indonesia, including including uh, uh, national and 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 and, and uh, others international uh, uh, institution or company. And what happened when the 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 movement uh, have begun? and the transition is happened. The, the leader of KPK already changed by the, the regime. And now the movement is stuck. And, and the, uh, the CSO coalition on monitoring, uh, monitoring the connection between the corruption issue with the, with the natural resources sector, including greenwashing, is also have difficulty access to get the data from the KPK uh, champion. So now uh, the regime is is um, changing, and 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 the CSO the CSO coalition is trying to to uh, to develop the other ways on 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 uh, monitoring their agenda on on including. Uh, anti-corruption on natural resources sector, including uh, green, green washing. But again, that uh, the changing of leadership uh, is also create uh, some challenging, new challenging, and, and it's happened in, in Indonesia now. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Uh, you first, and then you, and then you. Yes. Sorry. Investment and then uh, identify the business need and interest. So my question is, how you identify the business need and interest? Uh, if you consider like uh, the first one is about the time, because uh, when we talk about uh, climate action, sometimes it took medium and long term actions to get the benefit for the private sectors. The second one, if you consider location, geographic area where private sectors sometimes not willing to invest, especially if the program is in the rural and remote area. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for your question. Um, I think it is the interesting one, but uh, you know, business by nature is looking for profit, so they are very time efficiency. Um, uh, the way that we uh, identify the business interests and, and demands is uh, we work with them very closely. We are in, at, at I present, we are in the, uh, the member of the governor, the board of governors, and also the uh, working group under Vietnam Business Forums. So the way that we uh, very interactive, you know, closely interactive with them, and 
by that way, we can, uh, you know, uh, have their uh, priorities. For example, in energy uh, sector, renewable energy sectors, there are uh, a lot of, uh, you know, government policies. It's, it, uh, sometimes it conflict, sometimes it's not, uh, how can I say, relevant to, um, to the situation. So by working with business, they say, this doesn't work in Vietnam, for example. So we gather all the feedback from the business communities. So bring that up to the government. Uh, because, for example, under Vietnam Business Forums, business can meet with prime minister. And now they, you know, for exa another good example is the Vietnam Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industries. They are the largest uh, business association in Vietnam. They have uh, kind of thousands of members within their network. So they uh, collect the feedbacks about uh, new environment regulation, for example, on extended uh, producer responsibility recently, uh, to, see, to say that this regulation doesn't work in terms of deposit bank, for example. It doesn't work for, for, for business in Vietnam because it takes a lot of time to manage it, cumbersome procedure, something like that. So that kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, the approach help us to identify the needs of private sector. But we also do another kind of strategic approach to the political economy analysis, for example, for energy sector. We know who are the key actors within the business communities working on renewable energy. So we come to talk to them, interview them, and then by that way we can have uh, their priority or, or, or needs. That's it. Yes, yes, I, yes. I'm oh, sorry, you're looking for... Thank Good. you. Um, Martina Zapp, I'm from the Institute for State Effectiveness, so a fellow governance organization. Um, I was really pleased to see this panel in the conference program because my observation is that uh, the governance approach and lens is relatively absent in the climate change and environment space. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that it's not just the choir of the converted in here, but maybe that, you know, um, we, we were able to convince some people that this is important. But th this is my question, you know, how, what can we do to bring governance more into this space? Um, I recently attended the UN um, and DFAT conference, the Asia-Pacific Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Brisbane, massive three-day conference. There was maybe one session that could be remotely classified as a governance session and, and nothing else. Um, and yet there were so many officials that were sharing, you know, examples like yours of innovations, of practices, you know, both in terms of institutional arrangements, policies uh, that helped them deliver on some of the policy objectives. Um, and at the same time, also my organization here is a lot of examples where um, investments go wrong. Uh, and why do they go wrong? They don't go wrong on the technical side, but they go wrong on the governance side. Um, I'm also a peace building practitioner. There's also plenty of examples where such projects are hugely conflict inducing because again, they're not done properly in terms of the consultation. So it's all comes down to you know, governance approaches at the end of the day. Um, but yet I don't feel like there is enough attention to it in, in how programs are done in, in, in con conference spaces like these. So, uh, my question is, what can we do? Um, and you're obviously doing it today by bringing this panel here, um, but what else can we do? And do we need to do as a governance community um, to strengthen governance approaches in this space? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, I have thoughts, but would, uh, let me offer. Well, exactly why we're having this session is because even we don't do it very well. Um, it is amazing uh, how poorly even our organization is at uh, being able to champion the role, uh, uh, the role that we play in in the environment and um, uh, environment and climate change space. In fact, it was for that reason why I wanted to put this panel together to kind of help our own organization improve our ability. One of the things that uh, really struck me, I, when the uh, Green Climate Fund uh, first started got going in, in Seoul, I, uh, I, I registered our organization to be a, um, a, an observer. And I remember looking through their guidelines, how they operate, 
And I was curious, how are decisions made? How do they support uh, good climate, uh, uh, climate programming in the countries where they, where, where they meant to operate? I went through all of their documentation. I couldn't even find the word governance in any of their documentation. It, it took several years. I used to write to them and say, well, what about governance? And it sort of fell on deaf ears because they didn't understand what governance was. And I think part of the problem is governance is kind of an obtuse concept. People, when they think of environment, they go online and they see a black and white panda. And they think, oh, that's, what, that's who we should work with. We should work with WWF, or we should work with IUCN, or the Nature Conservancy. I've worked for all three of those organizations, and not one of them understands governance uh, as, as robustly as one would want them to. They're, they're all good organizations, and they play a very critical role uh, on um, environment and climate action. But um, you're right. Um, there's not enough awareness that, um, that the root cause of so many of the problems really come, to, come back to governance issues. So uh, I thank you for your question, and I don't have a good answer for it yet. Mm -hmm. um, it's a work in progress. Um, you were, I hope I sort of answered your question. You were the, the next uh, question. Thank you for the our panelists. It was really a great uh, examples and uh, good practice to share with us. Uh, my name is Twi Ariani. I'm uh, from Disability Red Fund and Disability Red Advocacy Fund. I'm the regional head of program for Asia. I'm based in Indonesia. Selamat sore, Pak Surya. <laughs> uh, my question to you all is, as we know that uh, my organization, supporting organization of person with disability, in advocating the right, including in climate change uh, programs. And as uh, we are working in countries that are really prone to natural disaster and climate change impact. Uh, my question from all that you have done, have you uh, recognized or have identified a good practices in how that your program has include person with disability in the decision making process on a climate program or climate policy in the country where you work? Uh, my second question is also when we're talking about climate change, about naturals, it's close to the heart of women. And a woman with disability is also part of that. So how your organizations and your program has been also supporting the leadership of women with disability in this issue? Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Um, not because we have done a lot in the sector, but because there has been some thinking put on it in the way we are working. So let me just say that even in relation to working on a village development plan, one thing is very important that those who are on the table deciding on what needs to be done needs to be fully representative of women and also women and men with disability. Um, it is not always the case because people don't, in, it's not something that they would always <coughs> instinctively do it you have to push for it. So one of the things we have realized is, unless you're cognizant and you push for it, it doesn't automatically happen. Because societies are such that they tend to think that, okay, there's a meeting happening, so those who can reach, for example, as simple as that, will reach. Um, and if you want to make it inclusive, you'll have to say, can those who not reach this easily also be able to be enabled to reach the place? So accessing conversation spaces is something that we are now focusing on. So if there is going to be a conversation on any kind of village planning, it has to be in a place which is accessible, both to women and in, in, in countries like India, it's also accessible to communities which are, who are usually marginalized, a combination of the Second thing is, um, you know, rehabilitation. That's the other thing. When any climate disaster happens, um, governments have a lot of scheme to do rehabilitation. Um, and I think the idea is to really closely look at those and say, how, much, how many of them are cognizant of differently abled people of all kinds? You know, is your housing scheme, is your rehabilitation area, the space, the school rehabilitation, are they looking into it? Unfortunately, it's not, I mean, India has had a very strong movement on disability and people, differently abled people's rights, but it's remained very narrow. It hasn't cut across to say the entire spectrum of climate work or the entire spectrum of um, you know, work related to energy and so on and so forth. And I think our attempt is to really um, influence that conversation by making those spaces at least accessible. Because I think um, it's, 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 peop 
it's uh, giving that space so that people who are affected have their voice to say, I want my housing to be like this. Just because your, the earlier housing wasn't uh, friendly towards differently abled people, it doesn't mean that the same game plan has to go in for the new housing you're building for rehabilitation post a flood or post an earthquake or post any disaster. I think those policies are now slowly creeping in, but we have a long way to go. It's not something, and I'm really glad that you're talking about it because I think it covers the entire spectrum of inequities. You know, not just uh, differently able, but gender, but also sexuality, age, you know. Um, so I think now those conversations are beginning to creep in. It's not like the government policies or the civil society have got the best plans, but giving space for those voices to be on the table is the first step, I think. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one last question. The gentleman in the back, I apologize. He suffered from the fact that my neck doesn't turn that far. But. No, really. No, it is because of the geography of the room <laughs> that I was excluded. So finally, I got it. But maybe some of my questions are already covered, but there is one or two I want to raise still. Uh, interesting presentation, all the case studies. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know, Asia Foundation's approach to catalyzing governance, because in some of the countries, uh, you know, talking about governance is not that uh, easy, uh, especially in the eyes of the governments. Um, and, and complying with the law of land, uh, I'm hearing some news from India as well uh, for those NGOs trying to work on governance, civil society. So I want to hear your reflections on how you yourself position in those difficult situations and confront those power and you know uh, constraints that uh, at the at the very first place affect your own work in those localities. Uh, that is first part of my question. And then second is, you do a lot of analytical work, uh, not just you know implementing or service delivery type of role that other NGOs, I NGOs do. Uh, so on that front, I'm interested to know the actual role of the analytical work, evidencing, you know, data, whatever you call, how you can leverage, you know, that with regard to civil society mobilization, multi-stakeholder dialogue, or all other things that you do, the actual role and potential of that kind of evidencing, analytical kind of, you know, stuff that can play out in catalyzing governance type of reform that you do. Thank you. So let me try to answer that because I'm probably coming from one of the most difficult countries that you mentioned uh, that to work in. But uh, it's also interesting, till very recently when people used to ask us, as Kim said, does the India office work on governance? And we used to say no. You know? And then we kind of unpacked our own work and said, well, wait a minute, we do work on governance, but it is related to sectors. You know, we work on gender and governance. We work on climate and environment and governance. We work on energy issues and governance. Um, how do you inject this? Yes, I think it's, it's challenging if, if I were to say that, oh, we work on governance in India where we are trying to tell local government how to govern. That would be a challenge, general government. But if we say we work on governance, the way we're positioned is we work with the local government because at the end of the day, the changes that can be made if you are able to inject a process into the government process is much higher than if you work parallelly. So our approach has always been not to work parallelly, but to find the entry point. So for example, uh, in, this, in the case study I was sharing, there is the entry point to influence village planning. And the, I, the way to do it is work with the local uh, elected local representatives and the bodies there and get civil society partners and organizations like us to be accepted in that space to inform them. So ultimately, the plan will not go out with an Asia Foundation stamp on it or a donor stamp on it. It will go out as the plan of that particular village in the block, but fully, fully kind of uh, supported by, um, facilitated by the local organizations and partners. So sometimes willing to take a back seat in the visibility, but willing to be in the forefront of the discourse is a choice you will have to make when you work on governance. And that's very important, you know, because government want to be seen as them doing it, and our job is to make sure that they do it well. So we definitely enter that space all the time with that perspective. Um, the second, I think, um, yeah, the second question is, is a little bit more like, how do you use your analytical work? It varies, you know, 
if it is something which is very to be locally done, I think it's also using data. So even for a lot of our, you know, the course that I talked about on hydro diplomacy, the work at the village level, these are driven by um, other partner organizations and think tanks who have gathered data of the next five years of the um, you know, rainfall trajectory to say, this is how this state or this part of India is going to see rainfall. And if you don't do these changes now, you will have more flooding. So again, using the information and analytics to see whether it feeds into an incoming uh, change that the government is looking to make. Or using sometimes information and data and analytics to really inject the discourse itself. So the hydro diplomacy is to inject the discourse. It's not like it's in the discourse. But we put it there to say, here are things that I think would be required from a good governance perspective to look at water as a, as a resource where the local communities have to have a strong say. Um, governance as being not driven by tribunals, but by collaboration. Not, so from contestation to collaboration. So those kind of thinking require you to engage um, more deeply. It does require some trust building, no doubt about it. You know, it requires some trust building. So rather than engaging from a critical point of view saying you are not doing this or this is not right, our approach is to say you could do this better by doing this. And those are entry points that we always have to look at, um, sometimes with our partners, sometimes independent of them. But I think as um, I, I don't know which one of our, my colleagues said, we have been in the countries that we are working for many years. We are not an in and out organization. That I think gives us a foothold. Um, it doesn't mean that it makes it easier for us than for others, but it gives us a foothold to be more sustainable in the world. So. Thank you very much for joining us for this session. Be satisfied in knowing you were in the cool session. Um, and I'd like to thank my colleagues for their presentations. Thank you.